have an idea that I want to share with you. An idea I feel that if you consider it, it will have a great impact. My idea is that awareness is the confirmation of responsibility. In other words, the moment you become aware is the moment you immediately become responsible. The moment you become aware is the moment you immediately become responsible. Now, I haven't had this idea my whole life, <laughs> but allow me to share with you how I came to it. Imagine me in the sixth grade. Oh, don't worry, I'm right there. <laughs> Then as I am today. <laughs> Back then where I'm from in the southern parts of Lumberton, Mississippi, you had to know how to fight. You had to know how to go to war. Because kids and people would continue to pick on you and bully you and make your life a living nightmare until you were able to prove that you were nobody to mess with. And I had a best friend, his name was Jake Smith. And he and I always had each other's backs. We trusted each other. We would call ourselves Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. <laughs> now, I, of course, is MJ. <laughs> we did everything together, y'all. We played basketball every day after school in the smoldering heat. We played video games every weekend, talked to the girls before I met my wife. <laughs> and we even looked out for each other's siblings. But one day, Jake gets into a fight with this kid named Caleb Jackson. Now, Caleb wasn't the best fighter, so I figured Jake had this one in the bag. The only thing was, Caleb had a best friend, too, Trevor Rose. Nonetheless, we expected a man-to-man, mono-mono fight between the two, with Jake, of course, winning. But that's not how it went down. So after school, the fight is underway. Jake, of course, is winning. When all of a sudden, out of the corner of my right eye, I see what feels like a monstrous brown blur lunge into the fight inaugurating the two-on-one unfair brawl, Caleb and Trevor were aggressively ganging up on my best friend, Jake, and I froze. I watched in shock as grass and dust flew into the air from their unbelievably violent attacks against my best friend, Jake. I watched frightened. You could literally feel the sounds of thuds, smacks, and bass-like vibrations as fist after foot pummeled my best friend Jake. I saw that he was bleeding, but I couldn't tell where he was coming from, his nose or his lips, as they arrogantly danced on the back of my brother Jake. And I froze. I just stood there, watching, but as if ignoring what was happening, but no, my eyes were wide open. Finally, the fight stopped. And they left with their victory and left my best friend lying on the ground. I watched in disbelief as my broken best friend staggered to stand to his feet again. I don't remember what I said to him in those moments. I just remember the instant feelings of disappointment, shame, guilt, cowardice, and the utter disgust I felt for myself. A coward, a Judas, not a good person and definitely not a good friend. I mean, what kind of person becomes aware of someone in need and makes the decision not to help them? How did it make Jake feel? How did me not intervening in his life impact him that day or for the remainder of his life? What about his family? How did it make them feel to know that somebody was there to do something but didn't? What if I were Jake? And I could have did something. I could have intervened. I could have tried something, but I didn't. And I hated myself for it. 
You see, that day I became aware that Jake needed my help, but I did not accept responsibility. I didn't even try. And I hated myself for it. I struggled with that up into my adulthood. I wanted to be somebody better. Somebody that when they became aware that they could help someone in need, that they would accept responsibility despite the risk. But I didn't know how. Thankfully, it would be later on that I would learn. So, I'm 15 now, I'm at a new school, and I meet this tall, genius, nerdy country white boy named Ryan. He was a skinny thing back then. I wonder how that boy fit in them Wranglers. <laughs> but Ryan wanted to make the high school varsity basketball team. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> I needed to pass Mr. Powell's ridiculous ball in two class. <laughs> also impossible. <laughs> but Ryan and I would go on to form an unlikely bond and partnership. We would become teammates and best friends. Well, although our plan was impossible, y'all, that junk worked. <laughs> I passed biology too. Ryan went on to make the high school men's varsity basketball team and went on to grow up to be an awesome father, a dad, and is currently overseas serving our armed forces. That's the part when you clap. <laughs> but that's not the main part of the story. You see, Ryan would later go on and introduce me to the hero of my life, his mom, Nancy. Now, Nancy was this kind, beautiful, sweet, courageous white lady who was also firm, militant. She carried guns and boots. <laughs> Real talk, her professional job was to lead government operations. But the girl still managed to make it home in time to bake cookies. And it's the reason I fell in love with asparagus. <laughs> Now you know, she had to be good. Because where I'm from, don't no black folks eat asparagus. <laughs> I mean, what asparagus? <laughs> but nevertheless, Nancy was phenomenal. She was supportive at every basketball game. She supported our teammates and our friends, kept us out of fights. She gave me advice, would put money in my pocket. She always showed up for us. She knew about my struggles adjusting to living with my aunt and uncle. She knew about my childhood trauma, battling chronic depression and anxiety. And whenever I run the streets and run away from home, she would allow me to spend the weekend with Ryan, and she never judged me. Well, one day I came home from school, and I had a horrible fight with my uncle and my younger brother. Y'all, it was so bad, I knew if I didn't get out of that house, I was going to do something dangerous or harmful to somebody or myself. And I ran out of the house crying and I called Nancy on the phone, and I will never forget these words she said to me. She said, sweetie, you wanna just come live with us? Nancy would become my new mom. Later on, she, she would make it official. She would adopt me, her family would embrace me. I would become her fifth son. her five children, she gave me my own room. She gave me a car. She taught me how to cut steak. <laughs> but the amazing thing was, she did this while going through a divorce, fighting for custody of my other brothers and sisters, working a full-time job, putting us through school, taking care of us, doing personal renovations on her own home by herself, and she never complained. Barely making time for herself. So if you ever see that movie, The Blind Side with Sandra Bullock, or that phenomenal sitcom, This Is Us, just know, they got that idea from me. <laughs> and that's the thing, that's the idea, is that my mom didn't have to do what she did. I was not a responsibility she had to have. But she became aware of how badly I needed her, and she made me her responsibility. Mom didn't know how to raise an African-American teenager. She didn't know anything about hair grease and a do-rag. <laughs> she didn't know anything about swag or the latest Lil Wayne album. But neither did she allow that, nor the social awkward pressure 
from anybody, white or black, to deter her from being the mom I needed her to be and saving my life. My mom knew there was a great risk trying to take me in. Something could have very well gone wrong, but even if it did, and thank God it didn't, I would still be proud because she would have tried. And it's because she tried, I became the man I am today, and now I have a family of my own. Moreover, I discovered all those years ago who I never wanted to be when I failed my best friend, Jake, by not accepting responsibility and doing something to help him. And I knew I never wanted to be that person again. But because of my mom, she was able to show me what it looked like to accept responsibility and to do something and make a difference. Two years ago, my family and I moved to the city of Charlotte. We were working full-time jobs, no family or friends, doing crazy community service, trying to save a church, work with law enforcement, boxes unopened, garage packed, us sleeping on mattresses when this happened. I still remember the images. I still remember the news cycles, the fear, the hysteria, right? And immediately I remember Jake, how he was ganged up on and beaten, how he was bleeding from his nose or his lips, I couldn't tell, as his green eyes searched for solace. And I remembered that I didn't have his back. And those memories birthed strong emotion a beckoning, almost redemptive. Except this time, I wasn't seeing Jake, but protesters, police, destruction, but also opportunity. Then I remember how I felt about myself, the feelings of instant disappointment, guilt, shame, and cowardice, and utter disgust, and how I never wanted to be that person again. So I remember my mom who accepted an obligation she didn't have to, who inspired me to become the man I am today, and who, through her awareness, birthed her responsibility. And the pride and the joy and the fulfillment of becoming aware, accepting responsibility, and doing something to make a difference. And now every time we talk a text, she lets me know that she's proud of me. And with that inspiration, I accepted the call of my awareness, that beckoning. One evening during the riots, I, I got off work, I called my wife, and I said these words, I said, babe, I have to do something. And she said, I love you and be safe. I was very concerned walking those dangerous streets those nights. I didn't know what would happen, but I met the most amazing people I met protesters, police, preachers, citizens, and more who will later become family. I found solace in their eyes. And in trying, I found both comfort and confirmation in accepting responsibility. Furthermore, I, I finally accepted who I was. And so that whatever we were gonna do to make a difference, even if we failed, I would be proud of myself to have failed trying. And so many beautiful relationships, initiatives, and things have happened in the city because of it. B.F. Skinner said that a failure isn't always a mistake. The real mistake is to stop trying. You see, I believe that we are all uniquely aware of something or someone that we can help become better in our world in our society, in our community. Furthermore, I believe that we are now more aware than ever a time in human history. We, as a humanity, we have got to decide who are we are gonna be? Are we gonna be like I was with Jake when I failed my best friend by watching as if I was ignoring, but with my eyes wide open seeing the impact of the thuds? the smacks, the bass-like vibrations, as our society 
is becoming pummeled and do nothing about it? Or can we be like my ever so awesome mommy, who with her cowboy boots and shotguns <laughs> and the asparagus <laughs> became aware, accepted responsibility, and did something? Mm. I want to make you aware of something. This is why we have to try. I literally feel like if I don't do something, I'll die. The need to try is insatiable. And whether we succeed or fail doesn't really matter. All that matters is that I do something, we do something, you do something. Lastly, I want to make you aware of one more thing is that when you attempt to make someone or something, your community, your society, our world, much better, that you become much better as a result. And in my preacher voice, I'm closing. <laughs> the moment you become aware of that is the moment you immediately become responsible. Thank you for allowing me to share that with you.